If you want to take your Bibles out and turn to Matthew chapter 2. We have nativity scenes that are set up in our houses and other places and sometimes uh, public places and we see them, but, but uh, what do they mean? Are they just for fun? Are they just for decoration? Or are they actually saying something? I want to suggest to you that they're actually statements about who Jesus is and what he means for us. So let's read Matthew 2, starting at 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And that's our reading today. So we have our nativity or manger scenes. And uh, there's usually wise men with them. So we have here Mary, Joseph, we have shepherds, we have animals, and then there are these wise men or magi. They're, they're not kings, actually, as uh, the, the song would say, but uh, they came to visit Jesus. And let's move this guy out of the way here. They came to visit Jesus, and we place them at our manger scene. And we're going to talk about them today. Why do we put them there? What are they, first of all, if they're not kings? It says magi in verse 1. Uh, traditionally, it was, they were known as wise men. But they were actually, magi are pagan religious leaders. They're pagan priests, if you will. They were probably, uh, their, their religious faith was probably Zoroastrianism, and that's not a very common religion anymore. It's got a couple pockets in Iran and such. Oh, brother. Sorry about that. Magi were pagan religious leaders. That's your first thing to write down. They were experts in astrology and fortune-telling and dream interpretation. So, they're not exactly people who are traditionally used to the kind of, the kind of uh, religion that would be of Christ. They're, they're, Christ is kind of a little bit foreign to them. But they were highly educated, they were wise men, and they knew about many other religions. When the Jews were exiled to Babylon. There were a lot of Jews who didn't come back. There were a lot that stayed in Babylon. And they had their religious traditions, like the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath was really strange to everyone. And so they, uh, they took that into account. And so there were these wise men, and they knew about all the other religions out there. And so they knew about the Jewish religion, what, what they had to say. And they were from 
the priestly class of what was then known as a nation called Parthia. Parthia. It says, it says there, Magi from the east came. So they were from out east somewhere. But Magi are the priestly caste of a place called Parthia. And Parthia was, was quite a, a uh, power, actually. It wasn't just some dinky little country. It, they, they defeated Rome in a number of key battles. And uh, that was, that was, they were quite a formidable foe. But that was where they were from. And because of that, Parthia, which is today maybe in Iran or Iraq, Parthia was King Herod's arch enemy. So when it says here that King Herod was disturbed about this and everybody in Jerusalem, they probably thought that this was a pretext to an invasion and that we were going to have to, we were going to, have to be going to war again with them. Because King Herod, he wasn't really a legitimate king. He became king after Roman Emperor Augustus gave him an army to conquer Jerusalem back from Parthia. What happened was that Parthia invaded, they occupied the area for a couple of years, and they set up a Jewish king. And lots of people in Jerusalem were happy about it. A lot of the people were. King Herod, he was Edomite. He had an Edomite father and an Arab mother. He was not Jewish. And so his claim to the throne was shaky. And he was rather paranoid about keeping his throne. And so he did whatever he could to keep it. If you do your Bible readings this week, you'll read the rest of chapter 2, or part of it, and uh, you'll see how how far he goes to keep hold of his power. But everybody in Jerusalem was disturbed because they thought, oh man, this, this could mean war again. These people are coming to find another Jewish king and to rise up and to overthrow Rome. This means trouble. Nativity scenes, we're going to go back to these nativity scenes. Now, they're not snapshots of the first Christmas. They're a message in a picture of who Jesus is. Because the Magi were not there that first night. If you read the first verse, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod. After he was born. And then later it says, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. He wasn't in the manger anymore. He was in a house. So this is some time later. I don't know exactly how much time. Maybe, maybe, maybe even two years, some say. But it, was, it wasn't that first night anyway. We know that there were three gifts also. It's, we have gold and, and incense or frankincense and, and myrrh. And so traditionally there's three wise men there. Three magi. But really we don't know how many because it doesn't actually say how many people there were. There were three gifts, but the Bible doesn't say how many magi there were. There could have been two to twenty for all we know. But we have three magi on the manger scene because there were three gifts. Okay, so the magi at the manger. What are these guys doing there? They weren't there the first night. They're pagan priests. They're, they don't even worship the true God, really. What are they doing here? These guys are the oddballs out. And we got all these shepherds and animals and these guys don't really fit too well. Why, why are they there? Well, manger scenes are in part making a statement. They're saying something about this is who Jesus is. One of those things is that it's obvious even to pagan priests that Jesus was the promised king of the Jews. 
Even pagan priests got it. Pagan priests from way far away figured it out of who this was. The people in Jerusalem, they didn't figure it out. All of the religious leaders, the people who knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards, they missed it. But pagan priests from another country and an entirely other religion, they figured it out. Jesus is the King of the Jews, the one who is promised in the Old Testament. He's the one. Even pagan priests could see it. Look at the uh, screen here with me. Why? Oop, go back one. There we go. Why is he called Christ, meaning anointed? Because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance. And one more. Our only high priest who has set us free by the one sacrifice of His body, and who continually pleads our cause with the Father, and our eternal King, who governs us by His Word and Spirit, and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom He has won for us. So Jesus is the promised one, the anointed one, and even pagan priests figured it out. Even they did. But it says a little more here, because these guys are the odd ones out on this manger scene. It also, they, they by being there on, on these scenes, they also say that Jesus is for Gentiles, not just Jews. I mean, Jesus came to the Jews. He was Jewish. This is where God's word originated from. His first followers were Jewish. But he's not only for Jews, he's for everybody. Even people from other countries who don't didn't weren't raised religious in the in the right religion. Jesus is for everybody who would come to him. So not just for Jews. Good thing for us, because most of us here are Dutch. Jesus is for those far away, not just nearby. So even though Jesus came to one place and one time, He's not just for that place and that time. He's for all nations and all times. Which is good for us again because He was born 2,000 years ago on the other side of the world, so we would be in big trouble. But He's not just for that, that place and that time. He's for all places and all times. And they're also a little odd at the manger scene because they are wealthy. Jesus is for the wise and wealthy as well as the regular. I mean, the shepherds came, but they didn't have too much to bring. And Mary and Joseph, they weren't, they weren't any, anything special in terms of money. But here these guys come with their gold and their incense and myrrh, stuff that costs tons of money. And they had enough money to travel. I mean, travel is expensive now. It was huge back then. You had to bring armed guards with you and a whole caravan. I mean, there weren't, there weren't McDonald's along the roadside, so you had to bring all your food with you ahead of time. It was a big ordeal. So these guys are rich and smart. And by the world standards, all of us here today are rich and smart. So these guys, in in that way, they represent us. We can come to Jesus too. But they also come bearing gifts. They They come bearing those gifts. And that says something too. The king deserves the best we can give him. And so as we approach him, come bearing gifts. And he came to serve us, but he is still our king. 
when you go to meet someone who's that important, you come bearing gifts if you can afford it. You come with whatever you have. In many other countries, hospitality is a huge deal. I've been in many places where people didn't know where their next meal was coming from, but they took all the food to their house and they, when I was visiting them, would set it before me and whoever else I was with. And that is just incredible. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm nothing special. I can afford my own food. But the hospitality was so important to them. We, we have a visitor. And we are going to give them the best that we have. How much more the king of the Jews or the king of the world? That's Jesus. When we come, let's offer our hospitality. There's a reason why we collect an offering as a part of worship. There's some churches that don't do that. And that's because they don't want to be about money. And you can understand that. But the reason why we collect during worship is because giving your money to God for His work, His word, His love, is an act of worship. They came bringing gifts. And so we come bringing gifts. And we do that not to buy God's favor, but just as one part of what it means to serve Him with our entire lives. And so, when you see the Magi at the manger, I want you to remember that Jesus is for Gentiles too. He's for us too. Wealthy and wise, and for those who are far away. And that we are to come bringing our gifts. And not just money, but everything that we are. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord our God in heaven, thank you for blessing us richly. Lord, thank you that you came not just for Jews, but also for Gentiles like us. And Lord, thank you that, Lord, we can come and give you blessings in return. We pray that we would think of you as our, our king. And Lord, that we would offer you our gratitude in not just money, but in everything that we are. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.